Hello and welcome to Minter Dialogue, episode number 392. Today is Sunday the 11th of October 2020. My name is Minter Dial and I'm your host for this podcast. This week's interview is with my great friend Bob Bijan. Bob works at Microsoft as a corporate vice president in charge of global events, production studios, and the marketing community. Aside from being a talented musician, Bob has always been a creative spirit, driving events in his personal and professional life. In this conversation with Bob, we discuss the differences in cultures between the French and American companies for whom he's worked, a behind the scenes chat about the real Satya Nadella, CEO of Microsoft, the transformational effect of the pandemic on events at Microsoft, and some remarkable insights, facts and figures about creating engaging events online. If you're at all interested in creating online experiences, you'll want to lean in and listen to Bob's mojo. You'll find all the show notes on minterdial.com. Please consider the drop in your rating and review, and don't forget to subscribe to catch all the future episodes. Now for the show. Bob Bejan, my goodness, how lovely <laughs> to get you on the show. You know, there's certain people in your life, you, you have fun dinner parties, you play guitar together, and, and just it doesn't really come to me that I needed you on my show. You know, we have so many other topics we can talk about, exactly. and we're probably going to roll into them. So, I mean, you've got a long list, uh, a great career. How do you want to introduce yourself, Bob? Well, I mean, uh, well, I'm, hopefully as a friend of yours, Minter, I'm very happy to be here, and that's thrilling. Um, but I think, I, I don't know, I guess a, 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 a creative business person. And creative you are. Um, you're, the studio that you have around you, which I'll put a, a photograph in, in the show notes, begets all sorts of creativity the way you are. Uh, but you're also a businessman, because you, you obviously have worked in major companies, uh, a Warner Brothers, Microsoft, Publicis, AOL. And today, uh, what is your job today these days, Paul? <laughs> these days, my, I'm a corporate vice president at Microsoft now, and uh, I am responsible for our events and experiential marketing, as well as our production studio facilities and our, the training and skilling of all of our marketing professionals across the company, worldwide. Can I... Can I say, woo? <laughs> I mean, I say that actually mo mostly because events, oh my gosh, you know, Big like changes. that does yeah, facilities, places people go to, oh my gosh, yeah. marketing, everything seems to, you know, be upside down. Yeah. So I, where I wanted to get started was you and I met when you were working, I believe, at Publicis in That's Paris. Right. And, uh, and, and we obviously connected on many levels. We have our beautiful friend Ted in common yeah. and Barbara. And you had worked at Microsoft. You'd worked at a lot, lot of other American companies. Then you have these nine years at Publicis. Mm. And for me, I've worked in American companies and also had 16 years at L'Oréal. So mm. two very French companies. I'd love you to see your side of what kind of differences cultural that you attribute to a French company like Publicis versus working for an American company. Is there such a thing that's countrywide or is it just company-wide? That's a great question. But listen, I have to give the background story on that one, right? Because in a way, it is this kind of secret master plan because it wasn't nine years at Publicis. You know, that's the thing. It really was only about two and a half years because what happened was, is I left Microsoft originally in 2002 to kind of go back to my entrepreneurial life. And, you know, so it was this, this whole thing about like, honestly, it was this, could, how have I matured enough in the corporate world to run a creative organization in a way that wasn't driven by insecurity and therefore by definition made it dysfunctional, right? Which is like what every creative shop I'd ever run before then was. And the, my first six years at Microsoft were really this kind of like, hardening of the business, not the, of the business side and being able to manage and learning how to do that and kind of, that. so I left in 2002 and we started this agency with a master plan. Like the two partners we started it with, I started with, we had this goal to kind of sell the company to a holding company within seven to 10 years. And it was like this project that we all three of us signed up for and said, okay, we'll do that. 
And you, it, it, we were just lucky in the sense that we hit a bunch of timing because our kind of business model was about not only quality creativity, but value, you know, because we were removing the account layer because a bunch of reasons, but it made sense at the time. And it was right when there was a big downturn in kind of business, um, you know, kind of going into the slump coming out of the dot-com bubble and everything. And that value was worked accelerated our business and then we sold to Publicis. And even though that was our, our target was a holding company, my secret target was, was Publicis because my dream was to get the family to live in Paris for kind of two years was this big master plan. And no mm -hmm. joke. I mean, like we literally have a slide deck from 2003 when we, we formed the partnership that kind of maps this thing, has the four holding companies, Asterix, Para, you know, Publicis as the acquisition target for us to be acquired mm -hmm. by. So then we were bought and then it worked out. You know, we, it, it, like they actually asked to have me go to Paris to work on a project uh, for the bigger group. Um, so it was a total dream come true in that sense, like just, just remarkable and kind of the way kind of everything fell into place. Of course, then it was just like one disaster after another in Paris. I mean, just like things went horribly wrong over and over and over again for us there, um, even as we had a great time and we learned a lot, but it long winded introduction, but important context to lead into it because from my perspective, like Publicis and the culture there, especially under Maurice Levy, you know, was everything I wanted it to be, right? And I had imbued it a lot with what I wanted it to be, but mm -hmm. it ended up working out, right? Like I had this office in the second, I rode a bike every day, I wrote every day. You know, it was really, even in them, and in some ways, the all of the craziness that now eight years later in our family is the fabric of the storytelling at Thanksgiving. You know, it, it achieved that objective as well. As painful as some of it was, you kind of go like, wow, man, the stack of journal I have of that time, all of it, the bond that our family has because of it, um, you know, it really delivered. And, and I would argue that it was the, off balanceness of the French culture and the need to kind of step up our game across all of us as a family. And then certainly me as a professional of like going, oh, okay, I thought I was formal before, but I got to get a lot more formal if I'm going to swing in this place kind of thing. You know what I mean? And, and, but when it, it's kind of that camp is what you make of it. And so mm -hmm. embracing that culture was, there was a game quality to it, even as it was hard. Um, just because it was so much more multicultural, so much more internationally focused. And, you know, as a American manager, you know, you really realize like, oh my God, you think you have a worldview. And certainly I had enough mileage and stamps in my, you know, multiple passports kind of thing that I'm, I was a world traveler and certainly considered myself like a citizen of the world. But then you live in a place that you know, that isn't in the United States and go to work and you go, oh, no, that's what it means to not be U.S. centric. And that was pretty humbling and eye opening. And it was it was very, very helpful in terms of it, it maturing me as a manager and as a creative person. Um, so. I don't want to pay, look, and then the downside is, is like, you know, hey, look, Parisian people, they grew up in, uh, they grew up in French people, they grew up in a school system that is tough, man. Like, it's mm -hmm. about beating you down. Uh, the joke I used to tell at dinner parties was like, you, I probably said it to you, right? Like, you know, U.S. school, right? You miss, you have a test of 10 questions, you miss nine, the teacher's going, but you got one right, next time you'll get two, you know, kind of thing. French school, you get nine right, they're going, you missed one loser totally you know it's like you know and so it's just everybody is just in a different kind of thing and and so that's hard because you just go like that shuts people down a lot and they're very risk adverse and they very it, it drives this fatalistic thing that i think is very counterintuitive to creativity whether it's in business or in just the acts of creativity right and mm. so like that's you kind of go wow that's really an interesting thing and 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 then the, you know, the, the, the influence of court mentality as a result mm -hmm. of the fact that you live in this kind of incredible broad court that is Paris, 
is interesting because it makes politics really kind of like, wow, you really have to slow down and figure it out. <laughs> it's not out in the open like politics are in American companies, mm. you know, which is not surprising, right? America, it's everything out in the front, you know, like people are like, I dare you to do this or that. And you really have to start to understand the 12 different ways people say yes, but mean no, you know, very much like doing business in Tokyo in a way, in that way. Mm. Um, but so I think that part can be hard. Um, but I was lucky, like people took me under their wing. I think I was incredibly lucky because, you know, Maurice Levy gave signals that I was kind of an okay person to be brought in and he helped a lot, um, and, and made it, you know, fun from a work perspective. Does that, so, does that kind of cover it? <laughs> yeah, it, it's a wonderful <laughs> answer. What I like about it, Bob, and something that I tend to want to encourage is putting everything in with a personal spin, by which I don't mean just a personal opinion. But the fact is that it, it's, it's all about everything. <laughs> and, and so I, I, my new book really delves into this idea, how can you be you in your shower with your family and friends and at work? So with yourself, with your friends outside of work and in work and how that's so relevant. So your answer for me kind of spills into that very much that idea. So when you came back to Seattle, what did you bring with you from your experience in Paris? Well, so fundamentally, you know, and I'll speak in very selfish terms first and then then because then I think because it plays into everything, as you said. <laughs> I had a goal going in back to Paris, going back, and I say it because I, there was a period of time where I spent as a performer, and I was lucky enough to work at the Châtelet, you know, Théâtre de Châtelet, and did chorus line there for a, a, you know about five months, and an incredible time. And at the begin, and it was really at the very beginning of my uh, writing career and composing and stuff like that. So I'd left a business that was just starting in New York to go back into the chorus line company and uh, spend that time in Paris, just to take advantage of the opportunity. And so, which is enormous. So, but then it was really the beginning of my, what I'd say is my creative writing life, I guess, you know, writing every day, you know, it's very romantic to do sitting in cafes, kind of, you know, you read movable feast and that kind of thing. And, and, Mr. But I, you know, I did with, it. With your, and, and so, with your gitan, with your yeah, gitan. I did. And I smoked gitans. I totally did it. I totally <laughs> you see? did it. You know, and I lived with a French girl. I met a French girl at lunch. At the, we rehearsed at the Châtelet Theater, their studios upstairs. They put the company back together there. And um, so we're rehearsing there and I'm down having lunch and I kind of, you know, meet this girl and we got, we hit it off and we move in together. And so that's where I, so it was like, oh, housing, awesome. And then, um, <laughs> But it worked out and we had a wonderful time and like she uh, starting to learn to speak a little French and that kind of thing, but really started to get this notion of a writing discipline and kind of getting up and thinking creatively and writing creatively every day. And, you know, then that carried for a long time. And, and then, you know, you start to get older and then I lost, um, I lost this journaling kind of rhythm and discipline and I had missed it. And so there was this big piece of going back to Paris with Publicis to kind of get that discipline back and start again and, and, and really stick to it. And I'm happy to say like that I, to continues to the day. Um, you know, I mean, I, you know, still continue to write maybe not every day, but probably five days a week. Um, and th you know, that's good. That's a good thing. And like, uh, and so that, that is a fundamental because I think there's this now, you know, literally there's this stack of books that's almost two and a half feet tall on my, you know, dress bedside table tied together. You and and me. I kind of go, okay, there's, there's something there. There's work there. And I go back to it and you can kind of pull any book out and open it up. And it's like, wow, there's like something there. And that's cool. And then I think that has in a way kind of wrapped all the way around into the work and into my family, you know, and I think we brought, what we brought back is all the things that happened and they were extreme, man. Like we had some extreme stuff happen to us in Paris. And so the depth of those stories, even though they took in some cases years to process before they became stories that my kids would verbalize. But now the combination of them, A, being able to talk about those things and then B, 
seeing themselves in relation to other people, so many of their peers who have not had kind of worldly or international experiences of that scale and scope, I think makes them more and more aware of how differentiated they are because of the year and a half we spent there. And so mm -hmm. like, that's really cool to see them come to terms with that and then really internalize it and then begin to not, I don't want to say use it, but, but use it, you know I mean? And leverage it in a way that's genuine and authentic to the point you're making, right? And really making it their own and then letting those stories kind of help define who and dimensionalize who they are in a world mm -hmm. where everybody's trying to differentiate themselves. Absolutely. And how about on a professional level? Did you bring anything back to Microsoft for BBC, your experience in the court? Yeah, maybe. I mean, I hope so. I mean, you know, you hope that everything that you do, all your experience kind of continues to translate and filter through, you know, the way you act and express and model and, you know, coach and do all of the work that you do if you're leading people and that kind of thing. But I think maybe in some ways this just this kind of ability or willingness to at least kind of contextualize what so often kind of gets people jump to conclusions, right? And at least in my experience, there are, as people communicate, and a lot of times, you know, US executives kind of, it's just, you have these goggles on to what we were talking about earlier, right? This kind of mm -hmm. like, oh, you have to really work in another kind of world before you recognize this egocentrism. But you have so much expectation when you have that and you don't really have a worldview of any kind. Um, this, I think now, especially, as the as even in the United States, companies are trying to turn more and more to an empathetic approach. I think that's what I maybe that's what came back with me is this kind of more appreciation for the kind of slow down, just shut up for a second, kind of, you know, and hear what's being said and let it sink in and process that first before you have to start going. Hey, here's how it's going to go. You know what I mean? I do. I mean, in the end of the day, maybe empathy is the process, but taking perspective is the more germane to the idea of what your kids and you have both come back. So is there not only one way to speak? There's not only one way to be. Maybe they're saying something in different ways and all of a sudden you can take nuances or at least you, what you immediately hear isn't what they said. Mm -hmm. In other words, we have our filters and all that. Mm -hmm. So. In, in your experiences, you, you've had these two extent stints at Microsoft stints, one ongoing. And, and uh, you were telling me before we started recording that you uh, were of the same ilk as the current CEO, Satya Nadella, uh, about whom I'm somewhat of a little fanboy, uh, at least from the outside. And obviously, you know him on the inside. No one's perfect. And I'm sure that that's the case. Yet, it feels like Microsoft in the 90s or 80s and 90s, my wife was working at Apple. Let's say that Microsoft was similar to IBM, the big bad guy, big blue, big bad guy. That's what it felt like. Of course, there's a relationship with Apple that's different, but in the end of the day, what I feel today is that Microsoft has a, a much more nuanced view and almost a charming view as I see it, the way I talk with people, it's, it may still have an enormous market cap and a big position, but for some reason, it feels different from the outside. What's your perspective? Well, I, I mean, it's important to say that at the outset, that I've been incredibly fortunate to work at Microsoft at two of the most exciting times there were. You know, I, I was lucky enough to come to Microsoft kind of at the height of just Windows 95 launching and this turn to the internet, right, to, to kind of lead a project to take MSN, which was then basically a dial-up access service into the hmm. internet space and launch the, web, the website msn.com, and then ultimately kind of build the ad business around that. Um, and so that was incredibly exciting under, you know, kind of all being at the, at the height of all of the Justice Department stuff going on and the antitrust work happening and all of that happening in the world. So it was wild to be kind of one of these crazy investments because back then that was really out on the edge of what Microsoft was investing in then 
um, you know, watching all this other stuff happening in the core business and everything that was going on. So like, it was amazing. And yet the company was, did it incredibly well in that period of time. Um, but it was the height of the um, Bill Gates, Balmer era. And, you know, lucky enough to have a lot, a fair amount of interaction with them. And um, even after, when we, when I left Microsoft, they became one of our first clients at the agency we started. And nice. uh, so, you know, we ended up producing, working with them a lot, you know, doing a bit, all kind of the strategic things, which is always an interesting time to see a company because, you know, whenever you're launching a big product, it's so, there's so much at stake and, you know, everything has to go perfect. And the, you know, the kind of the stakes are so high and, and the pressure's on, right? Because everybody's got to do perfect because it's all in front of the press usually. And, if it's not, then it's in front of your sales force that's responsible for generating all the revenue and you got to get it going and that kind of thing. And so, you know, you kind of see a company at its most stressful, at its highest level, dealing with the absolutely most important things to the company at that moment. And so like, that's a great strategic, I mean, it's a wonderful place to be able to kind of watch a company unfold. And look, it's just a different management style. And you know, to me, I kind of go, look, I have a lot of empathy for that because I grew up as an athlete, right? I grew up, I age group swimming, you know, water polo, swimming, my whole college, all the way through my college career, you know, and that's a mentality that, that was America's modern management mentality, right? The coach. And, and, you know, what are coaches for the most part in America, at least in my childhood and stuff, it's somebody that yells at you about what you did wrong, you stupid idiot, take a lap, you know, kind of, there's, there, was no, there was no participation trophy, you know, that, you know, all, all of those things that like you hear a lot of comedians make great material out of. Mm -hmm. It's because, you know, I mean, there's so much there that's, it's all grounded in that. And then, you know, now, and so in some ways, what I'm saying is, is that I think a lot of people want to give a bad rap to like, oh, it didn't work out. Oh, that's so bad. They bad culture. This, it's an easy thing to do, but it's much more nuanced than that. And look, they built an incredibly successful business by, you know, historic metrics. And, and, and it was an exciting place to be. And it was exhilarating when you did well in a Steve review or a bill review and like, you know, and yes, there are all these things that you can talk about, about diversity and both, you know, gender and, uh, you know, racial, all, all those things true, period. But then I think what happened is, is there was this period where the just wild success really like any business starts to top out and now you have to kind of do your second record or you, you know, well, or the 22nd record, but the next level of iteration of where you're going to evolve. And there was some struggle there and the old approach didn't work, you know, as things got moved more and more towards a cloud-based service mentality and those kinds of things. And, you know, and then, and then, I don't know, I think in any leadership situation, when that stuff starts to turn and you're the leader, it's hard not to push, and then that accentuates it. And then the culture gets kind of more and more sour because it's not working. And I think that really set the stage for Satya to step in and really exert his approach and style. Because you got to remember, like even back in 1995, he was working on a thing called Be Central. That's where I first got to meet him and work closely with him because we were doing MSN on the consumer side. He was working on the, B, the small business side. And so we worked quite closely together then. And then as he rose in the company, we worked with him consistently as his kind of communication agency when he was speaking in, out at, at things, when he was leading Bing, when he was leading the Azure business, when it was just starting out, that kind of thing. So it was great to follow him through and see him succeed. And that's the key, right? Total consistency in the way he's worked since the very beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, always been this, like when he talks about like going, you know, I'm a learn it all guy. I'm not a know it all guy. Like that's true then, true, 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 true. And, and it's just like, wow, it's impressive, right? Because, you know, it was a contra style in the 90s and 2000s of, at Microsoft. And yet they go to him again and again to solve the biggest problems. If you trace his career, which is really interesting because they recognize the talent, all of them do. And they just keep giving them the biggest problems and he keeps solving them and fixing them and getting it done. And, and it's just like, wow. And he really is this kind of seer of the bigger picture in the sense of, you know, going like, 
recognizing how important and being kind of prescient, right, in terms of being able to see the future, not only technologically, which you have to do as a CEO of a company like ours, but also this kind of this cultural conversation coming. And I think, you know, in some ways, maybe did the very best work there. And even if he didn't, couldn't articulate it five years ago, starting to move the company in this cultural way and raising it to the surface, you know, against a change management landscape that's really challenging, right? Like, like the technology business is a tough spot when you really start to take on that issue. And, and I think like, and if you back it up and you go, oh yeah, he's, this all started, this change management thing is five years in the making, you know? And it's like, and you're right. You say, oh man, we seem charming or however anybody wants to care. There are, a lot of, there are a lot of very flattering ways people are characterizing us or even more importantly, not paying attention to us as they focus their ire on others in the technology industry. You kind of go, it, it has everything to do with that. And I think, and I think it's, it's cultivated by hard work and consistent, you know, almost athletic-like dedication to the message and pushing, you know, a huge entity into kind of a higher level of awareness. I hope that doesn't sound like obnoxious, but well, but for I, me, I think it, that's what it is. It sounds real. You, you use the term empathy, which of course is a word concept near to my heart. If Microsoft doesn't use the word empathy as its values, Nadella or Nasaya, you presumably call him Satya. Um, uses the idea uh, and the importance of empathy, especially in this tech world. Because I mean, tech not only is not usually white male dominated in general. I mean, of course, that's not exactly true, but generally male anyway. It's tech, tech people, programmers, tend to be bereft of empathy if you scale them compared to normal people. Because mm -hmm. being a programmer, you, you need to be logical and logical is a poor bed partner of empathy. A, while a creatives like you are, is a different concept, but in the tech world, you're usually surrounded by a lot of people that are, are generally going to be more challenged by empathy. So it, it strikes me that he's really shifted the mentality, the, and presumably the culture dramatically from what it was before. Oh my God, it, the, the notion of empathy gets talked about constantly, right? And it has to, because modern leadership is repeating yourself with a good attitude, you know, like that's an absolute truth. And, and so like, we're talking about it all the time. We're training people on it. We're giving seminars, you know, uh, part of the responsibility of the group I manage, we, we, uh, get, to, we get to, you know, kind of care and feed and nurture and encourage all of the ERGs or the community-based kind of organizations across the marketing community globally at Microsoft for, you know, out at Microsoft for the LGBTQIE community, you know, kind of black light for the African-American black community, et cetera, et cetera. Eight of them across the company. And, and um, you know, it's, it's compelling to see all of that happen and watch that get traction and, you know, encourage and raise to the surface. You know what I mean? It's very you know, this is all part of it, though. It's all part of this kind of raising this level of empathy and trying to understand and cultivate and recognize that it's not something, it's not a light switch, right? You have to, it's a muscle <laughs> that you have to work on and cultivate and, and, you know, continue to grow, even as you become more empathetic, you know, there's always room for more. You were saying before that it started five years ago, at least it started before that because he's been, well, he started, he was CEO in 2014, but in any event, you don't light switch this stuff. And there's nothing worse than a company saying, we're Black Lives Matter today, but have never expressed it before, or is certainly not, it's not about it being expressing it, actually living it and believing it. Yeah. So want to have the last zone of conversation, if it's possible, Bob, talking about how, in this digital world, the pandemic world, your job in part anyway, is about events and experiences. Mm -hmm. And I would love to hear how you see that world evolving. Uh, is there going to be such a thing as a new normal? What does that entail uh, as far as the way you see it and what you're doing at Microsoft? Yeah, so, you know, uh, 
one of the cool things about working here is we're so incredibly hyperactive. Like we do so much stuff in the event space, especially in third parties, you know, like working with big organizations around the industries of the world, you know, kind of and doing all of these global events. And so, you know, very early on, we were kind of, you know, very sensing, hearing, starting to kind of get concerned, even as early as Mobile World Congress last year, which was what, the 20th of February. And so I think that helped us in terms of kind of going, wow, this is bigger than people really get because we were hearing it enough around the world that was like, oh, this is not going to be good. And so um, we were very fortunate that we were able to get in front of the SLT and the leadership team of our company and recommend that we just cancel everything and just like, let's stop concentrating on it and, and debating whether it's going to happen or not happen, save the money and then focus on digital events. And look, I, I, we did that on the eight, we did that on the 18th of March. And so I kind of go, wow, that was a lucky break for us because it really put us on this path that we've really been on for the last five months, which is a complete reinvention. I mean, literally yesterday, we did a complete reorganization of the team based on what we've learned in the last five months. And that is really what we're doing is we're making interactive television for the first time, right? And as a guy that's been kind of working on it for 20 years in one form or another from Warner Brothers all the way through at Microsoft, you know, finally what's happened is, is there's enough technological distribution, you know, broadband connectivity for everyone, enough mobile handsets combined with screens. And, you know, the audience is schooled enough in like how to participate, right? Either through chat or, you know, these social channels that we've all become so adept in, in terms of being able to post pictures and understand how to do quick, quippy little comments and that kind of thing, that the stage is set, that the palette is finally articulate enough where you're not apologizing for it, which is what, you know, basically I've done my whole career explaining interactive anything is like going, yeah, I'm sorry, the screen's loading slow, but, you know, imagine if you will, and then, you know, it doesn't work, but, right. um, but now it is. And, and so, you know, it, there's been this incredible transformation in our place. And I'll tell you, honestly, I think two things. One, it makes me feel like our whole industry and the events world and me personally were intellectually lazy for the last eight or 10 years because we could have been exploring this much more earlier and we just got forced to do it now. But now that we have, it totally feels like this is the center of gravity, even as you move forward. Because once you start to realize, if you, if you really start thinking about making television instead of making theater, which is a huge change on myriad levels, right? But once you start to do that, then you go, okay, now you're unbound by getting anybody, any speaker, anybody to kind of get on a plane and join you. You don't have to convince them that there's none of that, none of that cost. You can put it all into the production or into their fee, you know, or, you know, when it comes to guests, you know, when I think about it that way and the inclusion globally, you know, okay, here's two statistics that are worth sharing just to illustrate what I'm, what makes me so committed about saying that. Last year at Microsoft Build, which is our developer conference that we do in Seattle every year, we hit an all time high of developers globally that came and joined us there at 6,240 people. This year, we registered 230,000 people and um, 97,000 day one and 127,000 day two uniques spent more than 173 minutes online watching with us, which anybody that's like in the media business in any way knows that like those are crazy numbers that make no sense at all against anything you've ever heard of. Here's in the second one there. Africa, I got, we got a mail, I got a mail from the general manager that runs our kind of territory across the African continent. And he said, look, I, I'm sorry, it's coming a couple of days late. Thanks for doing build. I wanted to make sure I got my numbers straight. Here's, here's the deal. Last year, 2019, 24 African developers from the continent joined us and Microsoft to experience build. And, and this year, 6,404 were able to join. And you just go, okay. I mean, how could this not be the center of it? Even if live things come back and I, if is dramatic and it's probably hyperbolic, but, but I do believe that it's the, when live comes back, it is like little branches growing in rooms of 50, a hundred, 200, you know, repurposing multiplex theaters for high definition delivery of this TV we're making fully interactive consoles at each seat, that kind of thing. To me, that's where it's going. 
And then you can still kind of deliver, oh, and this kind of intimate cocktail party with the leader of whatever that company or brand is in that territory, which is all that really matters anyway. And so then you kind of go, okay, that's a way for you, you can get back that, what, what some people will never give up. And that's fair. And I, I love it too. But, you know, I think so there'll be a way to do that, but I think it'll be much more kind of like, you know, the leaves at the end of a branch that is the core of this video delivery. Because, I, I mean, if I was Satya Nadella, I'd never get on a plane again. You know, unless there was billions of dollars at stake and we were, he was going to close. And, and I don't, I'm not speaking on behalf of Microsoft when I say that. I, I, that's just me jokingly making an opinion. But I, I you know, that's kind of like I, you know, and, you know, you know me, I'm a theater bunny. <laughs> like I came out right. of the live theater and I believe You're a performance guy. Yeah, yeah exactly. Guy. So, I mean, that's, what, that's what's wild to hear, even hear myself say it. But I kind of go, God, it makes sense. And so what, the other thing that's happened is a couple times so far in the, you know, we've probably done 26 digital transformations now. I think, you know, five or six times, it's like, I'm, I'm, it's re it really worked. And you go, oh, that is what we're aspiring to do now, you know, more and more. When I hear you speak, you spoke about the positive impact of the numbers of people who attended the event when it was limited because of flights flying in, hotel reservations and all that. Now, you know, wow, the inclusivity, the diversity and the numbers. I can't help but think sometimes a lot of the things that I'm reading about, for example, cutting heads, is using this pandemic for the excuse to do things that they didn't really want to do before. So you may no longer want to travel, that's sort of, that's a personal choice. But I see a lot of companies, I feel, using this as an excuse to do things that they kind of wanted to do or it didn't seem appropriate, but now cut it. So, you know, let's get rid of free meals on airplanes. Let's get rid of that team because by the way, they weren't good anyway. Do you feel any of that is also happening? I mean, look, I, uh, how do I say that without, I don't want to sound flip, right? But I think uh, absolutely it's happening. Of course it's happening, right? Like there isn't any time in, I mean, recorded time, I think, where any people who are working in the commerce or the markets of the day are not going to hide in this, you know, kind of in the shadow of any tragedy and be able to kind of sweep a bunch of, oh, this is a convenient time to go, oh, lost it in the fire. Oh, <laughs> you know, I, I, mean, I mean, it's like, I mean, it's an old, it's an old story, isn't it? I, yeah. I think, but I think what's different now, there are two dimensions maybe for me. One is, is in some ways and in very real ways, and this is the optimistic part of me because I see it over and over again, all, all over the place. Authenticity, transparency is not only recognized but rewarded and that's key right in a free market economy like it's got to be rewarded because otherwise nothing's going to happen but increasingly and and case in point is the company i work for and what we, we, we've just been talking about right like it's like it is making a difference like that perception is is, is play, it plays a role in the performance of the company and and so i think that's one the hard part is, is that the mediums that we are also kind of in love with and have embraced over the last decade or so are, you know, blurry in their clarity and, you know, the, you know, yellow journalism or, you know, whatever manipulated journalism or, you know, fake news or Russian based, you know, chop shops for content makes it really hard to discern for the average person. You have to be pretty sophisticated to see it, you know, and, and that's concerning. And when you're trying to pass a message in a crowded, noisy place, if you don't stand out, then you don't get it, don't get the job kind of thing. So yeah. sometimes we push the frontiers in our marketing. Last question, which is immersion interactive. You mentioned mm -hmm. interactive television. Where does immersion sit for you in the future? Look, I speak to a certain degree with a broken heart about being too early to many interactive technologies, right? And, and so it's cost <laughs> myself, people I love and people I didn't know money <laughs> in public offerings and that kind of thing. So it's like, I, I have a certain amount of scar tissue about it, which taints my view. But 
I think it's the, it's the same issue. You have to have enough distribution to make it worthwhile to really kind of solve some of the key story problems that no one really is taking on yet because it's either, it's either just too hard to think about, which is true, or you, know, you think about it and you get a concept and it's just undoable from a production perspective, even in the digital realm now. You know, the it's the time is approaching where I think people will do a true kind of you know real interactive motion picture kind of situation, and the audience is increasingly growing in its sophistication to be ready to receive something like that. But I think that's just just very very hard, right? And so I think those are the kind of two pieces of it, Bob. I know you're not a uh, a Twitter fellow, but if someone wanted to know more about you, connect with you, do you have any preferred way or? Hey, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, that's the best place probably. Uh, and then, you know, yeah, my my, my Twitter handle, uh, my, my handle across the internet and every social medium is B. Bijan. So it's easy to find me everywhere. Uh, and I have a presence out there, even though I don't tweet very often. Right. Well, beautiful. Hey, Bob, thanks for coming on the show. It's a delight to hear your energy, your creativity, your positive zest for life. <laughs> thanks so much. For, this is a great conversation, Mentor. I've really enjoyed it. And it's great catching up with you. Thanks for having listened to this recording of the Minter Dialogue Show. You'll find the show notes and other blog posts on MinterDial.com. If you enjoyed the show, please head over to iTunes to give a rating and review. And to finish... Here's a song I wrote with Stephanie Singer, A Convinced Man. challenge I know soon we all die I like the feel of a stranger tucked around me precipitating the danger to feel free trust in my reason and let me show you why of